Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, again, this is our uh, fresh set of eyes member critique. We've had a few of them now. And today we're gonna have Julie Gilbert Pollard with us. And then I wanted to remind everybody, um, David Lobenberg is gonna be the next professional artist critique. And he's gonna be holding that, or we're gonna be holding that in August on August 30th. So after watching this critique and you'll see how great of a job I mean, Julie is going to give these uh, five artists some really good feedback. You'll want to be somebody who registers to have a critique, and that would be for the next one, and that would be with David Lobenberg. So just a friendly reminder there. So this, we're just going to give you a couple of announcements here. We also have our very first in live, in person uh, exhibition uh, that's going to be uh, starting September 1st and it will be at the Los Altos Library. It is the juried show, don't let that scare you. Uh, it just means that uh, you can submit more than one image and one of those will be selected by the juror and we are giving out awards for first, second and third. So August 22nd is the deadline. You will go log in as a member and you will enter your uh, paintings through the member login. And if you have any difficulties, just email myself or exhibits and we'll walk you through it. I hope everybody gets a chance to do that because it should be fun to have an in-person live exhibit at the library. And then next, um, Julie is gonna talk about her upcoming workshop and hers is a live stream on Zoom. And then we have two remaining workshops for the year, David Lobenberg, which will also be a live stream He's gonna be doing landscapes and sunsets. And I will tell you this guy, he's known for his portraits, but if you've ever seen any of his landscapes and sunsets, unbelievable, awesome. I mean, so colorful and beautiful. So take a look at that, I encourage you to try that. And then Frank Eber is gonna be a hybrid workshop. We're gonna try a new thing. And this is also something you'll see for the workshops for 2022. We're going to hold it in person, possibly at Hoover or somewhere else. And we're also going to live stream it for those of you who just aren't quite ready to come in person. However, if we don't get enough people in person, we probably, it'll be, I'm not sure if we'll move forward with the workshop. And Frank Eber is a wonderful artist as well. And then for today, uh, our artist and critique presenter is Julie Gilbert Pollard. And this is one of her paintings called Early Light. And she, I know, is gonna show you some, a painting uh, of hers, an image, and then what some of her markup and suggestions, I think for herself that she's done. Well-known, uh, wonderful artist, and she does many, many workshops and we are so lucky to have her. And for today, she's gonna walk through uh, five, I think five different, um, images uh, for uh, five members to show what her suggestions would be. So um, Julie, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna stop my share and then I'm gonna okay. bring it back to you. If we could highlight uh, Julie, spotlighter, there she Bye. is. Hi, and this is Julie Gilbert Pollard, welcome. And uh, Julie's gonna talk about herself and then screen share to show us her uh, take on the images that were submitted. So welcome, thank you. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Yeah. I didn't know I was supposed to talk about myself. I don't do that very well. I just <laughs> assume, uh, <laughs> move right on. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> let's see, I'm gonna start the screen share. Um, and I think I've got it all queued up, but it always, <laughs> it always takes me a minute to get it. Yep, no uh, worries. Okay. So, and then of course, the, the row of faces is always right in the middle. And I guess I need to click minimize. Every time I try to click on minimize, it goes away. There we go. Okay, so um, um, about myself, I have been painting for pretty much all my life, but I've been painting for professionally for over 40 years and um, have a few books out. And of course, it's my passion. And uh, it's always fun to share 
what I've learned and see what other people are doing. So um, I'm starting the um, critique session by showing how I will uh, be working on the, the, the five of yours. So this particular painting um, was a, a class uh, from, uh, I don't know, last year, I guess. I can't remember now. Anyway, um, obviously it's not finished. And additionally to being not finished, there are a few things I don't like. So um, this, uh, this, the share area is covering up some parts that I was going to point out. And by the way, um, my cursor, if you can see it, I use that as my pointer to, uh, to point to the parts that I'm talking about. Anyway, so I really hated this little mountain right here. It looks fabulous in the photo we were working from, but I just don't like it. I feel like it interrupts the eye, et cetera. Um, this part up here, it, it doesn't stay back in the shadow. Uh, this little curve here, I don't like. But the main thing is the tree, which I never did, uh, was able to finish in class and still haven't finished. The painting is still like it is. But if you can see, it aim, aims down this way. And yet on the bottom, the direction of that one goes this way. So here's what I start with for your critique. I start by showing your painting and then I show the areas I like. And then I get to this one where I circle the things that I feel need improvement. So right here, you can see how it aims this way, but then on the bottom, it, so it doesn't match up. So in my view, follow through is extremely important. The eye wants to be able to carry through uh, without um, feeling like it's getting redirected in a way that doesn't make sense. So this would be the carry through of shape, which doesn't happen here. Um, another uh, thing is carry through of values and colors. So I've done a pretty good job here. You could see that this color here, if you could see my cursor, does carry through to the other side. Um, it's not perfect but I think it's okay. Um, it's one area that I, you know, I, as I finish the painting, I might uh, work on that, maybe dark a little bit or lift a little bit if it seems like it's something that's noticeable. If it's not noticeable, then I don't do anything about it. But if it is noticeable, then I will try to fix it. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna continue on. So now you can see where I've done markup with my stylus uh, on the computer to uh, kind of figure out what to do. Um, of course, it doesn't tell me how to do it. Here, I would need to add value. And you can see that what I do is, um, I just make marks and squiggles with the stylus. So it's not gonna look like a watercolor painting, but if you kind of squint your eyes a little bit at it, and I don't mean a full on squint your face, I mean, lower your eyelids so that it not only blurs the image a little bit, but reduces the amount of light that comes in your eyes. Then you can see the big picture and you can get an idea of how that would look if I managed to make those changes with watercolor in a way that, you know, look, still looks like watercolor, doesn't look like, um, you know, uh, a patch that stands out. Uh, so I think this is better. This needed to be done. I made this more convex, I'll see. Yeah, <laughs> convex rather than concave. I'll just see the difference. Uh, so I think, I'm on my way to finishing the painting. So I just wanted to show you um, what, uh, what, I will, what I have done with the other uh, paintings that we're gonna look at. And I do want to um, make the uh, strong, strong uh, note here that, and caution, 
that you should never do anything to your painting, in my opinion, simply because I or anybody else says you should. In my opinion, for it to be successful, you kind of have to be on board with it. You can't say, oh, well, she told me to do this, so now I got to do it. I don't think that works very well. I think you need to understand the reasoning behind the suggestions. And then you have to, you have to agree with them. And of course, it helps if you can visualize how those suggestions are going to benefit the painting. Uh, and then, of course, you, after that, then you have to have the skills and uh, wherewithal to actually do it in watercolor on the painting. So I do have some um, illustrations coming up throughout to talk about some of these things, lifting and um, stuff like that. Um, so now on to the critiques. Julie, so, oh, Julie, before you get started, this is Susan. Do you, is this a practice that you do for all of your paintings or some of them, or is it, you know, periodic? Um, not usually for my own paintings. It's usually for people in class. Okay. Um, especially now that uh, everything in my world right now regarding classes is virtual. So if I'm in a class in person, what I might do would be to put a piece of acetate on their painting and paint on the acetate. So this is kind of a substitute for that. Okay. Does that make sense? Very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this is Anna Marie. I'm not I'm going to use first names. Um, I think up at the top, you can probably see the name. I'm afraid of mispronouncing. So anyway, this is Anna Marie. And this is her uh, picture that she's working from. It looks like it looks like Yosemite to me, although it's not maybe the iconic view that we see more often, but it's a beautiful picture. It would be fun to paint. So. Um, here's how she interpreted that scene. And the next, uh, so uh, take a nice look at that. Uh, she did ask some questions. Let's see, she, what she wanted to know was, uh, she says, I really like the mid-ground colors of the trees and found it difficult to distinguish them from the foreground. In what order would you add the different elements in the painting to achieve this? So I'm going to try to answer those questions um, kind of as we go. If I forget to bring something up, please feel free to remind me. Uh, so anyway, um, my positive comments are, first of all, I think she's got a really nice Um, so her question was, she really liked the mid-ground colors of the trees, but found it difficult to distinguish them from the foreground. Uh, well, I think the problem is, uh, as it almost always is, shape and value. Everything really, in my opinion, boils down to shape and value. So when I look at this, um, and compare it to the picture that she's working from, all these shapes are extremely different from what the picture shows us. Now, when I talk about that in class, I'll say, well, look at your reference, see, what, uh, see what's going on in the actual picture. If we're out in plain air, it's the same thing. We'll look at your scene, see what's actually going on. It does not mean that I'm saying, okay, it's in the picture, you gotta put it in your painting. That's not it at all. But the picture is our, it's our inspiration. It's why we're painting it. So it usually has a lot to tell us. Now, if we can make changes that will improve on Mother Nature or that little slice that we're looking at that we want to represent in a painting, that's exactly what we should do. But if we have problems that it just doesn't look like the scene, you just need to go back to the scene and see what the shapes in the scene are. So I uh, pointed out, let's see, this represents uh, uh, the distant shadow line and some other issues. The, the mountain kind of looks like it's taken 
a high right out. Um, so I did the markup on it with my stylus. And of course, as I mentioned before, this is, you know, it's not the perfect medium by any stretch. It's uh, kind of crude, but just bear in mind that I'm trying to show uh, how shapes and values, and of course we're using color as values, but how the shapes and the values can solve those issues. So I straightened out the horizon. I hope you can see that I'm pointing with the cursor. Um, and put a little shadow at the base. You can use the same colors throughout the whole painting. Um, you can uh, use cooler colors to recede and water colors to uh, clean up. But hot colors can actually recede and cold colors can advance depending on the shape and the values that you use in it. And I think I have something to sh I can show you later if I can remember uh, when we're done with this screenshot. I think I'll put that here as a reminder. Um, so now we're going to just toggle back and forth between the scene and her paintings that I've done some markup on. I brought the tree up, um, simplified the shape, um, and again, Oh, uh, another important thing, this uh, forward mountain wasn't coming forward. And you can see in the picture that it does come in front of the background, or the one behind it. So really, she got her values a little bit opposite of what they should be. Because it's darker on the back uh, mountain and lighter on the foreground mountain. So that's oops, what she put. Uh, so that's what I, that's what my sibling here is supposed to indicate. Julie, so, Julie, this is Susan. Some people at are... At this point, yeah. I would like to know if there are any questions. I turned my speaker down to get rid of the echo. I'm not sure if I can hear them. Can we... Uh, can you hear me through the phone? My speaker, my speaker back up so I can hear what's going on. Okay. So why not to talk? <laughs> Julie, this is Susan. If you, can you hear me? Yes, okay. I can. Okay. Some people were asking about the type of program or app that you are using to to show your markup to do those, um, Ill, you know, the the differences. Well, I have three computers that all have Windows 10, and they all came with this program of uh, uh, Paint 3D. And I didn't, there wasn't anything extra I had to download or purchase to just paint uh, with all three of those computers. So I'm guessing it's uh, just the kind of standard thing that anybody could use. Now I do have a stylus uh, that is uh, proprietary to two of my computers, uh, the ones that I use for this. And what is the name of the com those computers, just so people know? I beg your pardon? And the stylus that is proprietary to the computers, what's the name of the uh, computer? Oh, uh, well, I've got a Dell, and, and the stylus came extra. Now I'm using my phone to hear, and I think that might, that might be what's going to work for us. Uh, so um, my stylus came, I just had to purchase it separate from the computer. Uh, and then my other little computer I used to travel with, I've had it for three years now. It's just a Microsoft Surface Go. A very small computer, but it's still a computer. It's about the size of a tablet, but uh, it has all the Mac Microsoft Office programs and I should say apps. Now, nowadays it's apps, right? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. anyway, it's, I also had to buy the stylus separate. Yeah. But they are proprietary to those two computers. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I use the Microsoft service as well, and it comes with a stylus. So yeah. sometimes you just have to check and see if there's an option for that to purchase or if it comes with it. Yeah, the stylus I bought for the Surface, I got it at Best Buy. Uh, the one for Dell I bought last year. I bought the computer last year, so I had to order it online uh, through Dell. But yeah, there, there's nothing special. Uh, about either one. Any other questions? 
people, anybody before she moves on to the next one? Okay, so far, so far, no questions. I think we could move forward. Okay, uh, so I stuck in here a painting of my own uh, that is similar to that thing that um, Anna Maria, I hope I remember the name, I was working on. This is uh, down in, in, deep in the canyon in uh, West Fork up in above Sedona. So anyway, here's my reference photo. And here is my painting. I can't, uh, oh, this painting was in Splash 18. What did I have next? Uh, That's beautiful. Oh, yeah, anyway, I thought I'd put it, I uh, have the steps that I took for this, but I didn't put them in this uh, slideshow. Uh, but it shows how I basically started and used the traditional light to dark because one of her questions was uh, what order would you add the different elements? And I can show those um, later if you want me to. And if we have time, um, I'm going to have you kind of remind me um, and you can tell me later if you want me to go through the steps because I've got them. Um, for you to see the drawing and for step one, two, et cetera. Perfect. So that's just if we have time and if you ask me to do it. Okay, that uh, sounds good. Anyway, it's a traditional light to dark. And it's not dependent on the subject matter. It's dependent on the values in the painting. All right, that sounds good. Does that answer the question? I think I think. Uh, so. or, <laughs> no, nobody asked, <laughs> uh, except for Anna Marie on her notes that she wrote. So. Yeah. Anna Maria, are you there? Can you do you you could unmute and ask questions if you want. Oh, I, I just wanted to thank her for uh, for reviewing my my uh, watercolor and her suggestions. I don't know if you can hear me, but that's can you hear me? Yeah, she can hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I couldn't. I could just barely hear a little mumble and the okay. very faint. You maybe just talk louder. Uh, I said I wanted to thank you for your input on my uh, watercolor and uh, it makes me think I, I'm thinking maybe I might try it again and and do another painting of it and think more about the values and changing the way I I approached it this last time that's all I don't know if you can hear me but that's I try sending a message but I don't know how to even to get to the dumb message here but anyway thank you for your input did you get all that, Julie? Oh, uh, you're welcome. I heard, I, I heard part of it. <laughs> and she, she was saying that she's going to... The mute button came up again, so I don't know. Maybe I on the main screen I was un, unmuted, but let's play around to yourself. I'm still getting it back now. Okay, on to, on, on to the next. Uh, so this is Linda's. And so she's got this beautiful little painting of a, I don't know, a mom or an, not a mom, maybe an aster. I'm not sure what it is, but it, uh, the second screen shows the parts that I really like. She has done such a beautiful job uh, with these, um, with the petals, really looking at the shapes. Look at all the, um, uh, all the, uh, overlapping shapes that look so natural. I think she did a fantastic job on the drawing and also the painting. Uh, Design-wise, I think uh, I could offer some suggestions. So the areas to improve, I believe, are that all these petals and that leaf form a straight line across the top. I think uh, she could improve on that, plus, uh, I think she should, could have a few more items going off the edge of the painting to kind of um, anchor uh, the subject matter. The, the bowl is asymmetrical. Um, in my opinion, when you paint this realistically, you really need to make sure that um, uh, you get these man-made objects symmetrical when I mean if they are symmetrical and then uh, I think this uh, bottom flower kind of uh, design wise kind of gets chopped off so uh, I did some markup on it and brought some leaves up and out so 
I've got one touching over here, a few touching here, which if you have your design going off the page in at least three points, at least three edges, it gives you a more uh, sophisticated look. Now, of course, she does have this cloth, this drapery going off. I, I personally didn't feel that was enough. Uh, I also felt like with the really dark background that the flower would really pop if she darkened a few negative spaces uh, in the area that looks like it might be uh, turned away from the light a little bit. So I did that. Um, I, uh, when you use that, this program and, the, and a stylus for yourself, you'll find it's kind of hard to get that stylus to go exactly where you want it to. Uh, so I don't, I did not make a perfectly round bowl, but I did um, bring it out on the right side considerably. And then I overlapped it with some petals. So overlap is a really important uh, part of design. Uh, overlap gives you instant depth. I think I overlapped, um, uh, I can't tell if I look close where the stylus did it. <laughs> uh, overlapped the, the panel here a little bit, overlapped that. Change the shapes a little to give it a little more depth here, and then brought this flower off of the bottom, and um, a little more depth a few uh, places in uh, this flower. So if I go to the next screen and we can toggle back and forth and you can make up your own mind as to whether you uh, think these things would be an improvement or not. You know, um, these critiques are only, uh, since I'm the only, it's not a panel of critiquers, it's just me, so it's only one opinion. Uh, my opinion is not necessarily the best or only way to improve a painting. It's simply my opinion at this point in time. Yeah, we appreciate so, that. Uh, you'll need to make up your own mind about that. Now, I don't have the reference material she was using, um, uh, but um, maybe perhaps it was... Um, uh, still, I've set up that, uh, and I actually probably should be saying you. Uh, is Linda here? <laughs> yeah, Linda. I am. Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Um, I, I didn't like it because it just looked very artificial, um, uh, and, and it's probably not the right way to say it, but kind of Van Goey. So it didn't, to me, didn't give the same realism. I, I really like your suggestions in bringing up the... Um, uh, the leaves and taking it over and anchoring below. Yes, it was uh, a setup. I used crystal. I was trying to uh, learn and practice how to do crystal. It was actually a little off, but I think because of the way I painted it, it made it lopsided. Um, I can only hear part of what you're saying. I can hear Susan just fine, but um, you and Anna Maria could hardly hear. So uh, let's see, I think you said um, it was a little bit off in, in actuality. Um, so here's my opinion on that. Uh, if we see something in person or we see something in life uh, or in a photograph, um, we kind of just tend to accept it. But uh, the viewer is a lot more judgmental when looking at a painting. And so um, the looser you get, the more you can get away with. So for example, Charles Reed, who was uh, such a fabulous uh, painter, um, you can look at his paintings and you can see all sorts of lopsided um, oh, pictures, uh, vases, whatever. But he was so loose, he could get away with stuff that I can't personally get away with. Um, so the time and the tighter you are, um, and I don't mean tight as a pejorative term, but the more realistic and detailed your painting, 
the more, in my opinion, the viewer is going to pick up on anything that is asymmetrical if we kind of know that it's, it would be more or less symmetrical if we were seeing it in person. Thank you very much, Julie. That, that's, um, that means a lot. She said, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. I couldn't hear that either. <laughs> All right. I was so sorry the system didn't, um, yeah. at least we were able to do something, right? Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, moving on, I uh, see Marion has this um, beautiful uh, seascape. Looks like it's Dinosaur Cave Park. Um, now, her painting is a very cropped down version. So the next one, uh, in order for me to work on markup, I really needed to see a better view of exactly what she put in there. Uh, she did take, let me toggle back, she did take this path and move it over into her uh, painting, which I, I really love that. Uh, so as I did the markup, I didn't have the path in front of me, but this is basically her composition. So this is her painting, and um, got some lovely things going on here. Uh, let's, uh, what I wrote on it was um, really nice quality, soft, pretty color, very atmospheric, uh, a really nice feeling to the painting, the, the, the method that she used, the colors, et cetera. Um, my uh, areas to improve, in my opinion, are that the shapes don't represent the actual scene. Now, let me uh, um, uh, say a little bit more about that. So as I do critiques, all I can do is you know, I can't look into the mind of the person who painted it. So if that person uh, was trying to um, make a statement that's something I can't see in the painting, um, I don't have that to work with. So as a representational painter myself, all I can do is try to imagine how I would interpret it and how I think this painting should be improved. And of course, and I said it before, it's only one opinion. Um, but, I, uh, but if you're looking at the scene and those cliffs going down to the ocean are what is really attracting you, I don't think you can really see that in this representation. Let's see, additionally, uh, the, the way the flowers are treated are not really harmonious with the other painting quality in the painting. So here's my markup. So I looked at the picture to see what was actually going on. And really, the bottoms of these cliffs are very flat. They're not, um, uh, and the tops are kind of flat. I mean, there is a little bit of a diagonal going on here. Uh, but I flattened it out quite a bit, uh, flattened the mountains out quite a bit, and just uh, to the, uh, the, the extent of my own capabilities of making it look more like the actual scene, uh, did quite a bit of, of uh, markup in here. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, as I said, I love the little path. Now, uh, the flowers, I would try, um, if it were my painting and I were putting those flowers in, which were so beautiful, uh, I think I would make a bolder statement with them and try to get the, the uh, painting technique to match up or at least harmonize with uh, the rest of the painting. and pick up a little bit more. If you're going to make a statement, maybe make it more. Uh, so as I was doing the markup, um, I had the flowers lower, and then I realized that overlap is, I didn't have overlap. I had these flowers ending right at the top of this uh, piece of um, value in the water. So I brought them up over to help pull them forward more. So. Uh, there's a scene. Oops. There's the scene. There's my markup. There's her painting. There's the scene 
sink in. So you can make up your own mind as to whether you think uh, these uh, shapes would improve the painting. Uh, Marion, uh, uh, Marion, are you on the call? Yeah. yeah, I am. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I'll I'll interpret. Okay. <laughs> Tell her I I really appreciate her input. Be able to hear the rest. We'll see. Go ahead, Marion. Tell her I really appreciate her input and um, I love the changes she made. It was just. I couldn't see it the way she sees it. And now that I see it, I, I see a different direction than I was even thinking that I could take it. So I really appreciate it. Did you hear that, Julie? Uh, yes, I, I could hear her. Thank you for those comments and, and your, uh, uh, you're welcome. Um, now here's a, here's a, a tip. So it, it, it works whether you're painting in plain air or working from a photo. But if you have something that is, um, you can't quite interpret uh, between your brain and the paper, mm -hmm. take your pencil and hold it up to the image just to see if it curves down or curves up. Mm -hmm. um, you can do angles, um, just match up the angle, but having a straight edge, such as a pencil, pencil, and just lining it up with whatever shape that you're looking at um, can be an eye opener. Uh, we thought we knew what the shape was like, and we put it on the paper, and it doesn't look quite right. Well, mm -hmm. if you want to compare with the picture or the scene in front of you, you have this tool, your pencil or a brush, you know, whatever straight edge you might have to... Um, See what's actually going on. Sure. Well, I've been, oh, I do so that much. when I draw. Oh, another thing I really liked about it is that you interpreted this scene as having been shot before all those buildings were there to ruin it. <laughs> I did. Well, I do. I do really like your interpretation. The softness. Um, I just think there was a shape and value issue. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate the fresh set of eyes. <laughs> and moving on, uh, let's see. Oh, um, so I've inserted uh, some things here and there. So one of the ways I would do um, flowers, and of course this painting isn't finished, but uh, let me just show you. Uh, instead of doing uh, a lot of little dabs, I would find the whole flower shape and uh, then find the light side and the dark side. So uh, this is in shadow because the sun is coming down from here. So the shadow is falling across here. But you can see that that is still one uh, large variegated shape with an edge to it that kind of says flowers over here. Uh, the, there's no cast shadow on it, the sun is shining here, so it's a little bit lighter and a little bit darker over here. But again, I gave it a flowery edge, but within it, it's more or less a variegated shape with, uh, I did leave a little bit of white here and there. Uh, so that's just one example of how I might treat those flowers to uh, be a little um, more watercolory, if that's a word. And then next, uh, another, now here I had a background that I painted around the flowers, but <clears throat> excuse me, but again, um, I try to treat the flower shape as one large shape where I can, and then a little bit of embellishment. Uh, to make it look like specific flowers. So a little bit of specific and a little bit of non-specific. So those are just some things that, um, some techniques that I myself use. Oh, then the yellow one is a little more specific. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Oh, <clears throat> uh, thank you. <clears throat> okay, next is Rosie. Um, painting this absolutely delightful, precious, uh, little girl 
and uh, of course portraits are always chan challenging. Here's her painting, which is also delightful. And my comments uh, uh, are that it's just all overall, uh, has overall charm. Uh, very nice use of color. Uh, just really captured that beautiful little soul. Um, in more technical terms, I think, oops, uh oh, I don't know how that happened, but <clears throat> I think areas of possible improvement, and I'm, I might actually say not to do that on this particular painting. It's, it has such charm. I think maybe just take uh, take what I'm going to show you and maybe work uh, some of my ideas into future paintings. Now, um, the eye shapes, I think, could use a little improvement. Plus, I think uh, they should be more uh, similar in size. Um, so I used to be a portrait, uh, commissioned portrait painter. And um, when I, and of course, we're all lopsided. I think the eyes probably in the picture are a little more the same size than in the painting, but anyway, we're all lopsided. <clears throat> so when I would find that um, uh, those areas of um, asymmetry in a face, I would correct them even if, if it meant <clears throat> excuse me, changing them from what was actually uh, the case on that particular face because I uh, didn't feel the person would be happy if I portrayed them as being uh, asymmetrical. <clears throat> if it's a real strong character or personality, uh, visual personality issue of that, or not issue, but uh, aspect of that person, that might be a different uh, situation. Uh, but I did feel uh, that the eye, this eye is too small. Um, and I felt like you could do a little more with the modeling in the face. And it feels like the chest is a little bit too small for the face. So what I did uh, oh, uh, this just points to the eyes. You've got them pointing up, and they really don't point up that much. I also drew a line around the nose to correct the nose and nostrils a little bit, as well as the ear. But anyway, what I did was I put the picture and the painting both in Photoshop, and I measured. So the chest me feels too small for the head. When I measured in the photograph, the distance between the bottom of the chin and this point on the chest are almost identical to the chin to halfway up the nostrils. And so when I measured your painting, uh, I think you got it almost exactly right, but it still felt too small. So I didn't do the whole face because it just really didn't have time. This um, <clears throat> uh, process uh, to do it to where I personally am comfortable with it being as good as I can get it is quite time consuming. So I didn't do the whole face. But I did, uh, you can see what I did in the chest. And I'm going to, um, I, I brought it down just a little bit at a sharper angle, I think, and added some shadow um, and lightened this part right here just to help the eye go down to give the impression. I probably lowered it up just a tad, but I think your measurements were really, if not exact, they were really close. But I still have that feeling of the head being too large. I hope that makes sense. Um, uh, so I also put a light along the edge of that uh, cute little top. Um, I didn't do anything with the hand. I feel like the hand probably needed a little attention. But I, um, and the back uh, needed to be a little more rounded. Um, but 
What I worked on the most was the eye. So you can see, um, let's see, let me, I think I can go to the next picture, which is the, the actual picture. So you can see how that eye goes around and down more than it goes up. The eyelashes, you can see my cursor, the eyelashes go up, but the, the inside of the eyelid actually goes down. Um, so that's what I tried to do. Um, this was really difficult with the cursor because the cursor just did not want to put a mark exactly where I put it. So um, it, is, uh, it is crude. I'm going to zoom in on the eye um, a little bit uh, again so that you can see it a little bit better. Put the highlight on the nose, the highlight on the cheek, um, and rounded out that eyeball. Um, Rosie, are you uh, on? Are you on? You're with us. Do you want to unmute? Do you have any questions? Um, how yes, about, are there any questions? Uh, I, I like I like all your comments. I, I'm wondering about the background. Does it need a background? Um, regarding the background, I like it being just white. Um, so I see that you're, oh, I forgot to uh, mention Marion's um, questions. I'm sorry, Marion. Anyway, back to Rosie. Uh, let's see, how to get darker contrast in the face without distorting the skin tones and what paint, um, oh, I guess you didn't ask about background. You're just asking about it now. So <clears throat> I put in a, um, a painting of my own that I did of my uh, grandson quite a few years ago where I have him on a completely white background. Now, I think you could come in with a background if you like, uh, but I personally like the white background. Um, if I were to put a background in, I would probably wet this uh, whole area and then put some darker values right around uh, this part right here, if you can see with my stylus, and over on this side and let it just do a wet and wet blending into that background white. That's what I would do. I wouldn't probably do anything that would take away from the face. Okay. Uh, so you can look at, um, oh, I think, you know, what we all need to continually do is look at paintings by other uh, painters uh, in the subject matter that they painted, you know, painters that we really like, and we'll see some that put, um, you know, the, um, gosh, I can't think of particular artist names at the moment, but some of them will put everything with the kitchen sink behind the, uh, the person's uh, head, and it looks fantastic. I don't do that. Um, you can see others that leave a white background and others that do just a very kind of, I don't know, nondescript, amorphous um, uh, set of brushwork, brushstrokes, and values, which I do more often than not. <clears throat> Most of the time, I, would, I don't you leave just a white background. But I did this one time, and I, I like your painting just the way it is. That's my opinion. OK. So I'm going, to I'm going to go through to, to the one that I'm, uh, I am painted on my grandson. Now, this was back in uh, 2001, I think. So it's an old painting, and I, I didn't have a good, well, digital cameras weren't, didn't have that many uh, pixels back then. So I think this was a slide that I did a slide scan of. So it's not a very good uh, quality photo, uh, but... You can see that I left the background totally white. And in modeling the face, um, I actually use some hard edges. I think you need hard edges. And the hard edges, because the values are uh, correct values and the shape is more or less correct, um, it still looks like a baby face. Um, oh, the other thing I was going to mention on, um, I think her name is Noelle, 
On Noel's neck, I flattened it out. I didn't think on a baby's neck you should probably, even though it shows in the picture, I felt that a flatter, warmer uh, wash would be more in keeping with a baby, which seems very contradictory to what I'm saying about this picture. Um, let zoom out. Uh, but I did flatten it. I don't remember what was in the picture, actually. Um, but I think you can see he still has that baby complexion, even though I use hard edges. Um, I also, when I do a portrait, I like to um, have the subject with light on one side. <clears throat> I hate to paint from a picture that's been taken with a flash. I like to have a light side and an out of light side. So it's not uh, tremendously uh, different, but you can see that if you look at the forehead, the forehead and this side of the face are a little bit darker than this side. And then on the neck, you can see where there's a, a shadow being cast across his neck. Um, oh, you also asked, how, uh, what paint colors will achieve shadow without turning the skin color purple? Well, I don't mind the skin color being purple. Um, but here's what I use uh, for skin tones in the shadows. And I know you really can't see it very well here. But I use uh, cobalt violet mixed with yellow. Now, different cobalt, different brands of cobalt, bio, cobalt violet, well, some are pinker, some are bluer. So I would probably go with the pinker ones. But, you know, violet and yellow are opposite on the color wheel. So they together will make a neutral, but they're not complete opposites. So cobalt violet and yellow, and I've used um, anything from, I don't know, lemon yellow to... New Gambos to uh, Raw Sienna. In, uh, you just have to experiment. But any of those, any yellow, pretty much, mixed with cobalt violet, will neutralize it, but not turn it into gray, because they're not exact opposites on the color wheel. And they also, the cobalt violet has that uh, sediment, you know, that granulating sedimentary quality that gives texture, which helps, uh, in my opinion, really helps with skin because if I try to use, um, do skin with, um, oh, a flatter color like uh, phthalo blue, I can, I have made it work, but a flatter color like that or a really strong color such, uh, such as ultramarine blue, I don't have nearly as much luck. And then when it needs to be a little bit darker than you can get with that cobalt violet, I'll go slow. I might add some cerulean because it's a bluer and a little heavier. And then um, for real dark parts of the skin, gosh, it might be Antwerp or, but I, I take it slow and easy. Because you can get a face to looking heavy and harsh really quickly. So I think you should try the cobalt violet and yellow mixture and see what you think. Okay. Do you have any question or comment on that? Rosie, do you have yeah. any other comments? You're painting one more time. Okay, I guess not. Okay, moving on. Um, Oh, my, fav uh, my favorite subject matter is rocks and water. So, um, Wendy, I know that your other painting was a cat, which I also love cats, uh, but I, it's been a long time since I painted cats. I used to follow my cats around the yard and uh, in the house and draw them and paint them, and, and then I would try to, try to get their anatomy right. I would... Uh, feel their bodies to feel where those bones, <laughs> they didn't like that at all. They knew the difference between being petted and being a piece of meat for the artist, the easel. <laughs> That's funny. So anyway, <laughs> that was just, uh, I went off on a little tangent there, but 
My favorite subject is rocks and water, so I had to choose this one. So I like the picture. Um, and here's your painting. Uh, so I see that you moved the flowers up here uh, to make more of a statement with the flowers. And um, my ideas on the nice qualities are I really like the way you simplified the background and put color in there that wasn't in the picture. Um, I can see some wet into wet. Uh, it appears to be wet into wet, like you wet that upper portion and then just painted wet into wet. Um, I like the, uh, it looks like wet into wet down here in the little grassy area between all the, among all those rocks. I like the color. I like the juicy wet into wet effect. And you also have some overlap. Overlap is really important in almost everything, in my opinion. Um, we've got some, but I've, uh, uh, the areas I think need to be improved are the, some of these rocks are too mechanical looking. Uh, the uh, shadow sides don't always look like they are matching up. Uh, with the other side, there's too much of a hard edge around the entire shadow shape. Um, and some are too symmetrical. Now, one of the problems with rocks, I feel, is making them too round. And you didn't do that. So uh, congratulations on that because rocks in nature can be extremely round. But if you paint them that way, then they don't feel hard. They don't feel rocky because so much of what we do in painting is symbolism. And so to make them feel hard, you do need um, angular, this is my opinion again, angular uh, edges, you know, less rounded than they actually are, uh, geometric, um, which you have done, which I uh, applaud. Uh, but some of these shapes are too symmetrical and too foreign from to the actual rock shape. So I did quite a bit of markup to um, uh, put in more overlap. And of course, I did round a lot of them out because I think in making them angular and rocky, I uh, did feel that you might have gone, you might have overcompensated. So um, I overlapped, and then one of the things that I like to do with rocks is to make sure that I have a strong uh, light source, and then try to stay consistent. So I felt like your light was almost overhead, a little bit to the right, because you had some shadows coming down, and... Um, it's hard to make up shadows. I think you have, let's see, you did have a shadow here and, um, but I tried to make them more, um, have more form. And then because I like your flowers, I made them, uh, more of a statement, tried to give them the same light as the rocks so that the red is a little bit lighter, a little more shaded underneath here. Um, let's see, what else? I kind of flattened this out a little bit. Um, I didn't quite, I guess this was a rock, but it just felt to me like it might, it just felt right to bring that grass on over so I could plant another little flower. Um, and again, this is only one person's interpretation. Uh, so there's the picture. And you can see that there are indeed some very round rocks. And uh, she made them less so. Uh, in some cases, I made them more so. And if I, th I think now if I went back, I might give this a little more of an angular look. Uh, that rock, um, maybe a little more here. Um, 
So there again, there's the picture. When, so any questions? Wendy, are you on? I, <clears throat> I am on. Okay. I'm not showing my camera because I'm at my sister-in-law's house. The bandwidth isn't good. That's, that's fine. Do you have any questions? <laughs> I don't, but I really appreciate Julia's um, example of what she would do with the painting because it looks much better than what I did. And it answers some of the questions I had about what to do, say, in the background where the trees are and how to make the painting uh, sing a little bit more. I can only hear part of that, Wendy. Um, when, I, uh, when I teach rocks, well, here's an example of one of my rock paintings. So every once in a while I teach a workshop that's um, only rocks. And this is one such case. So when I choose a rock picture to paint, um, I try to get one that is backlit so that I have, I can paint value on the face of the rock. In this case, the sun was, oh, that, it was back up on the right a little bit, but the face of the rocks were um, turned away from the sun. So I have a lot of overlap. Um, I didn't put the picture in that I was working from, but I think this one was probably very round. If I went back and did it again, now I'm looking at it, I, can, I would probably put the apex of the, the curve of this rock a little bit to the left. It gets a, as I'm looking at it now, it might be a little bit too symmetrical. See, yeah, I have the apex of the curve on this rock off center. I mean, you know, some things you just don't see um, until you look at it a long time later. Um, and I use a lot of color, but uh, this is what I wanted to show you. Um, I think it's a good idea to do little rock studies. And the rock in question was a lot rounder. I flatten it out. Um, another trick is to keep the tops of the rocks light. And painting light to dark, paint the whole rock unless you need some actual white on it. And if you, if I zoom way in, you can see where some of that color just goes right through to the, to the shadow side. And then the shadow side, and I broke the line of it here and there so that it wouldn't um, look too foreign to the rock itself. And then some crevice shadows as the last step. So this is just a little quick uh, study, but when I, I don't do it anymore, partly because I haven't done any in-person workshops in a while, but I used to, and then I, I don't feel like carrying a bucket of rocks around with me, but I used to actually take a bucket of rocks to the classroom so everybody could pick up a rock, feel that rock, kind of, you know, feel the hardness and then pass the rocks around and everybody get a different type of rock. And then we pile the rocks up in the middle and we do a painting of the rocks. Awesome. So rocks are tricky. And I think part of it is because we don't uh, give them enough attention as to um, the, each rock has its own personality, if you will. So I really uh, love your composition and that you were studying rocks and uh, I hope you'll uh, do rocks and water with me in a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, that was gonna. Um, that was what I was gonna say. This will be something that you'll be doing in your workshop. So, um, you it's know, actually, it's actually yeah. a workshop I would love to take. Yeah, but, got a really uh, pretty picture picked out, and we're gonna improve on it. Yeah, we're uh, in the process of moving uh, to Pennsylvania. Um, imply that if you decide to do anything, you're paying. You're either going to have to do some lifting or, um, you know, opaque or watercolor ground or something. So I've got some examples to show you. Um, Linda, so this is a painting for, from uh, a workshop uh, the end of last year, I think. 
and it looked great in the drawing, and then I got this far, and I really hated this. It's awful. <laughs> I just hated it. Um, so I lifted it, as you can see in the next picture. So I, I scrubbed it all out, scrubbed a little bit here to make this branch a little skinnier. Um, lifted some of my shadows that I also did not like. I felt like I went in with too heavy a hand. So I lifted it out and then I redrew. And then painted. Uh, and so now I feel that yeah, really and truly, if you look at the painting, you, you really would never see where it was lifted. Partly it's because um, of the painting dark, darker over it later. So the dark helps crisp up that edge that still looked a little bit lifted. You know, I repainted the shadows. Uh, so that's one thing. When I lift, I will use um, a soft brush to begin with, just an aquarelle, half inch aquarelle. I have what I call my um, sacrificial brush because rubbing paper with a brush can really ruin it. But I have sacrificed it to the cause and you can get a lot of paint off with a fairly soft brush. So here's the painting. Uh, I worked really hard on it. It was supposed to be for my book, Watercolor Unleashed. And I absolutely hated this. That's the way it was in the picture. But it looks, I just felt like it, it just looks stupid sitting there. I didn't like it. <laughs> so I washed it out. Um, I scrubbed it really hard with a sponge and really gave it a lot of elbow grease. And so the sponging gave it a softer lifted edge, which kind of looks like, in my opinion, it looks like um, a sedimentary color. And I was fine with it. And then I painted on top of it, then on top of that lifted area, I painted, I extended this um, tree up into that area. And so there's a little bit of sharpness on top of the lifted area. So the other way I lifted on this painting was in the, uh, the one you saw before. This bird was already there, but I decided I needed more birds. So I put a piece of packing tape on top of the painting and um, with an exacto blade, I cut out a bird shape. And because all of this area was protected with the packing tape, and the edges of the tape burnished so that no water could seep in under, then I really scrubbed with a, a sponge again. And it's surprising how much paint will come off of the sponge if, um, if you can really bear down on it. If I hadn't protected the area around the bird, then I just have a big mess. Um, I did the same down here at the bottom. I put this bird in with the same technique. And then when it was dry, I painted over the shadow side of the bird. So uh, those are two more ways of changing shapes in your painting. And I'm kind of moving along because I, I can see that uh, I think we've gone over time already. No, we're good. Um, we're good, Julie. We go to at least 1230. I do have a oh. quest two questions from okay. um, from. Uh, one of our members and the first one is is she asking uh do you limit your palette of paint colors and mix to get the colors that you want or do you use a lot of different tube colors i have a, a palette uh, that i use all the time i actually have three different sets of colors uh, but for most of my studio work and classwork it's one palette of colors the palette holds 18 it has 18 wells um, and I hardly ever use, uh, well, there are a couple of colors I hardly ever use any time at all, but I typically use six or seven colors in one painting. Okay. And then secondly, um, secondly, she wanted to know, 
Um, what medium do you use to sign your paintings? Uh, watercolor. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I use uh, the brush that's on the supply list. It's uh, an artist watercolor fable pointed round by Windsor and Newton. And I use a, usually I use a size seven. It's got a really fine point. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so this painting, um, it doesn't really look that bad in the picture. But this little, it's a, a picture with rose hips. And um, this one, it kind of got out of hand. And so I went in and put some acrylic on it. And I didn't like that. I really didn't like this at all. So this is, these are just details of the bigger painting. Um, and by the way, this whole painting was done with uh, acrylic, fluid acrylic diluted to watercolor consistency. So this is all um, transparent fluid acrylic. Uh, but uh, that's kind of beside the point because what I did here was very carefully paint that berry with uh, watercolor ground. So I could have gone in and painted it opaquely again, but um, I decided to do the watercolor ground. And then You'll be able to see here where um, I then went back in and painted that berry um, transparently. So watercolor ground is also an option. Uh, works really well with uh, discrete shapes. That was a very discrete shape that I was that I uh, used it for. If I have a big amorphous shape. Then I'll just kind of feather out the edges of that watercolor ground. And it's a little tricky, but you can learn how to do it in such a way that um, it, it looks fine later. It doesn't, oops, I'm pushing the wrong button here. It doesn't look like, um, it, you can't tell. But you have to learn how to use it. Now, the other thing I was going to show here was thinking back to, let's see, uh, whose was that? Uh, oh, Linda, I think. Linda's flower painting. Um, so often because I don't want to have to worry about uh, making a symmetrical vase or pot or whatever, I will put things in front of one side of it um, that... Um, obscure one side, so I only have to worry about getting one, uh, one side drawn correctly, and the other side is hidden. If you do have uh, one that really needs to be symmetrical and you're going to show the whole thing, one little trick, somebody told me, and I couldn't believe I hadn't thought of it myself, is just trace it and then flip the tracing, and then you autom like a paper doll, then you automatically have a symmetrical shape. Um, well, that's what I had to show in terms of um, the critique. Um, I know, Susan, you'd like me to talk about the workshop. Um, this isn't what we're going to paint exactly, but I'm going to pause here and see if there's anything that you, any questions um, or comments or, you know, anything uh, at this point before I talk about the workshop. Yeah, so anybody, if you have a quick question, you can unmute yourself and, and you know, I will translate if uh, Julie can't hear you. Other than that, I did ask her to go ahead and talk about the workshop um, as it's coming up in a couple of weeks. And in fact, her demo is on Sunday the 15th. So you will see her uh, paint. Uh, let's see. Um, I don't think I don't see any questions. So if anybody has anybody, has... I have a question. Go ahead. This is Emma. Go ahead. What is watercolor ground? They're wanting to know what is watercolor ground. Well, um, it's an acrylic product. Um, uh, Daniel Smith has one now for years. 
I think Winsor uh, Newton has, has yeah. one. Yeah. And they've had, yeah, it's been out for a few years too. Uh, they're similar, but not exactly the same. So it's a ground that you can apply to almost any surface, and then you can paint watercolor on top of it. So what it feels like to me, it feels like gesso that you've added a little bit of pumice gel to. Um, a long time ago, I used to have paintings that uh, were horrible, <laughs> so I would just I would just coat the whole piece of paper with gesso uh, and then paint on top of it. But sometimes some brands were really slick, and I know one time I did add some uh, pumice gel to it so that the gesso would take the watercolor. Um, anyway, that's what watercolor ground is. Okay. Uh, comes in a jar. It's kind of expensive, but it can give you a do-over on your painting because the watercolor adheres to it really nicely. All right. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right. Okay, we're good to go. All right, Julie, I think you can just talk about the workshop. All right. Um, so for the workshop, uh, we're going to be painting a mountain stream, my very, very, very favorite subject matter. And we're going to um, use various techniques to help you get the, that splashy water uh, we're going to focus on rocks, of course. This is not the scene that we're going to be doing. This is the one that um, <clears throat> I found it might be the closest. But um, in order to get the water to splash up around the rock, here's a good example. I use a splatter technique, which we're going to be using. Um, I use a a lot of color. Uh, so in this painting, I think we used um, um, Indian yellow, uh, maybe lemon or Windsor lemon, but all I see right now is, maybe we did, okay, I think we did. Uh, now I'm looking, I think I can see some lemon yellow here. Um, we used two reds, uh, Scarlet Lake and um, Quinacridone magenta. We used uh, two blues, uh, cerulean blue, and was either Antwerp blue or Prussian blue. I think it might have been Prussian blue. And I think that's all we used. Uh, so those, or that's all I used. You know, you never are required to do exactly what I'm doing. You're never required to use exactly the same picture that I'm using. Um, you know, I, my, um, my, uh, workshop style is very, uh, loose and, uh, uh, informal and, um, I never think that my way is the only way and, um, let's see, what else was I going to say? Look us, um. Uh, Focus on rocks, cascading, splashing water. Of course, negative painting because it's watercolor. Uh, we did use a little bit of um, masking fluid. This is splattered masking fluid. Uh, but uh, And there's a couple other places. I think that little spot was masking fluid, but most of it is negative painting. We did mask out some of these. Um, you can see this is masking fluid up here. So we've got a few different uh, techniques that we're going to use and um, um, try to just have a have a good time with uh, with this waterfall that we're going to be painting. All right. And I'm going to stop my screen share now. Yep. So now I can see you and you can see me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Great. Well, this has been a very, very um, enlightening for me. Does anybody else have any final comments before we let Julie go? Um, again, her. I hope you'll join us back for her demo on the 15th on Sunday. That's only, what, a week and a half away or something. And then certainly for the workshop. So anybody have to any other questions or comments? 
I thought it was great. Thank you so much, Julie. It was great. Can, can I ask just uh, when is the workshop? I don't have that date. Uh, the workshop, I believe, is August, is it 16, 16. through 18? Yes. Yes, I believe that's right. It's 16, 17, 18. Okay. Right. So that's a, yeah, that's a Monday through Wednesday. The demo is the, the day before on Sunday at 1.30. And again, we'll send out an email reminder to everybody uh, to join that. So I hope you can. Julie, thank you so I'm much. Not, it's been wonderful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Very valuable. Thank you. Yes, valuable. Thank you. Don't worry. I've had glitches, but that never happened in that way before. I can't wait to see what happens next. It's going to be new and different. Well, hopefully, it'll be all good for the demo and for the workshop. I'm sure you'll get a workshop. The workshop that I taught the last two days, Friday and Saturday, everything was perfect, although I had. Uh, disconnection on on Thursday, so the rest of it was all good. Yeah. Yep, they are. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. We're going to end now. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful. Thank, thank you.